Already international support is pouring in for Libya's new interim government. It has been tasked with leading the fractured country to elections at the end of the year. Formed in Geneva under UN-sponsored talks, the new leadership will have a lot on its hands. From maintaining a shaky ceasefire to laying the groundwork for a lasting political solution, Libya has endured a decade of chaos since the overthrow of longtime ruler Muammar Gaddafi. Leading the team will be former diplomat Mohamed al Manfi, who will head the three-person presidency council. Their mandate won't be easy, December 24th. That's the deadline for parliamentary and presidential elections. In just 10 months, the interim government will have to strike a delicate balance between armed groups and foreign powers, who are ready to work with Libya's new leaders. But will that be enough time? Can Libya's political fractures be healed in time for a free election? To discuss this further, I'm joined from Istanbul by Ahmed Uysal. He is the director of the Orsam Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And also from Istanbul, Anas El Gomati. He is the director of Sadek Institute, a Libyan political and security think tank. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Anas, what's your take on this new transitional government? And has this come to you as a surprise? Certainly has. I think the process was designed not only in the last several months, but if we go back to the last five years of diplomatic meetings, the concept was to mold and merge the Libyan National Army or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces under Khalifa Haftar and reconfigure the presidential council of the government of national accord with one of their candidates. And that candidate was really Agel Salah, the chief of the parliament in the east of the country that backs Khalifa Haftar. Yes. His name was on the list of this last uh, process in, in Geneva, and he failed. And that process was really designed, many analysts and diplomats believe that this was designed to appease Khalifa Haftar and Agela Salah. The very fact that they lost throws that whole process up in the air, but it also questions what of the last five years, what are the results of this uh, accord, and whether or not the peace will actually hold. So I think there's much more in terms of obstacles now as a result of this deal than even before the war. Mm. So, Ahmed, is 10 months enough time to hold free elections? And what are the immediate obstacles uh, facing the new executive authority in Libya? I think there is a security uh, challenge. Also, there are many services that are lacking, uh, plus the uncertainty of these uh, new government and as well as the legitimacy and whether they are up to the job and they they can also unite the libya are the major challenges mm -hmm. uh, of course uh, and the last yesterday's visit by uh, by uh, president uh, menfi to to haftar khalifa haftar was not a good sign and good uh, message to whole libya because uh, you know uh, looks like uh, similar to agila saleh he couldn't, uh, he may not, uh, I mean, uh, get out of the control of uh, Khalifa Haftar. And this is a bad sign because he he was the instigator of these coup and uh, mm -hmm. he tried to topple the legitimate government uh, more than one, once. And uh, so there are uh, suspicions and doubts about uh, the, the ability plus the uh, the the legitimacy of this yes. new government and of course i mean it is better uh, than before i i'm not as pessimistic but uh, whether they can do it is is a big question all right so um anas what do you make of akila salah's statement uh recent statement that the government must work from sirt until tripoli is cleansed otherwise there be no vote of confidence what's your take on that statement and could this alone derail this process? Absolutely, Aisha. We, we've seen this film before. Agela Salah frustrated the government of National Accord from 2016 onwards by rejecting a parliamentary vote, uh, uh, subsequent parliamentary votes uh, to ratify the government. And so I think what he's threatening to do is to continue as he has done before and spoil again. And I think that's, when we see this in its broader context, let's not wrench it out of its context. Agela Salah was sanctioned as a result of that in 2015 and 2016 by the, United, the European Union. He was released from those sanctions as a result of the latest political developments in the last few months and the negotiations that took place 
in Geneva. So I think Aguila Salah knows now that not only can he spoil, but that he's immune from sanction again. I mean, it, it, it's double jeopardy. You can't do it twice almost. And I think the second aspect is that the, the language in of itself is not only reckless to use the word cleanse, mm -hmm. but it tells you that conflict dynamics on the ground are as they have been, irrespective of the process. Aguila Salah still wants to see the military opponents that they failed to overcome over the last 18 months in Tripoli. He still wants to see them beaten, maybe not through war, but through negotiations. Mm -hmm. And I think that leverage, that bargaining power is going to be a major, major obstacle because it's, it's a reflection of the degree of which spoiling can take place in Libya and the degree to which the diplomatic process in its heart has failed. Yes. If you can't sanction those spoilers, there's very little that you can do to make it a conducive and cooperative process over the next 10 months. Yeah, during this precarious ceasefire, we know that Haftar forces reinforce control over air, air bases in Sirte and southern regions, and they drew this red line from Sirte to Jufra. Uh, we'll see what's going to happen to that. So, um, Ahmed, how will this transitional government impact the international players' presence in Libya? I think it is. Um, it works on both sides. The international players, they they want Libya in in their wishes, in their version, and of course there are many sides that support kind of illegitimate uh, coup uh, type of government, which doesn't depend on popular legitimacy. But people of Libya also get tired, and they uh, they rejected the coup attempt by Haftar and and their supporters. Now they have to balance the inside and out, and Libyan people are tired of instability and conflicts and etc. They are lacking uh, major basic services and in a very uh, extensive way. So they want to solve their own problem. They know they have resources. The Libyan people has resources, and they they want to use them. But these spoilers. I agree with Mr. Enes uh, because they, the spoilers are not punished or are not discouraged by the international community and by the international law, and they are repeating their mistakes and their futile uh, attempts for uh, taking over, and this is uh, not yes. supposed to be. And the, the new government now uh, try to balance the... I mean, we know that the UN has the kind of tutelage over the process right now, which is not... Uh, uh, totally good because uh, you know it doesn't leave the decision to the Libyans, and uh, there are many foreign interests at play in, in Libya. But uh, if they can manage the, to balance between the two, I think they can uh, proceed. But uh, we'll see how uh, how capable yes. they are. Uh, yes. So, uh, Anas, how did Cairo, Moscow, and Paris react to the new government? And of course, Aguila Saleh's defeat. Will they genuinely accept the outcome of the elections? I don't know, honestly. I mean, it's it's a it's a really a big question mark hangs over this process because those very same countries not only accepted but invited the government of national accord after the Sherat agreement in 2015 that produced the last unity government. So the only thing that has changed is that this government is called the government of national unity, and the last one was called the government of national accord. Mm -hmm. The very same actors are at play. The very same conditions. Are at play. But if I might, the very fact that we have such desperately difficult conditions on the ground, we should remember the Danish Refugee Council in Libya called the living conditions in Libya apocalyptic. I mean, we, can, we can't really kind of describe them in words. They have to be seen. And the danger of that is that those kind of conditions, as we approach a decade on since Libya's revolution, those kind of conditions when you don't have basic running services like electricity and water, when you can't get cash out of a bank for years on end, those kind of conditions impact the way the psyche, the political decision making of the electorate. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it ripens many to think of the extreme simple solutions. And it's the simple solutions that are often the most dangerous. Just give it to the army. Just give it to a strong man. We've seen those things before repeated in other theaters and other countries. And I think the danger now for the UN is that if they don't start to repair those services on the ground, then Libyans will start to look for more extreme circumstances and those conditions ripen people like Khalifa Haftar to launch coups. And we should remember, he has been launching coups in Libya for over half a century, yes. since 1969. This isn't the first time. So speaking of Haftar warlord, Khalifa Haftar Ahmed, what do you make of Turkey's position and will um, Turkey's presence remain the same in the coming uh, process? Yes, Turkey will uh, remain defending the legitimate uh, government and legitimate process and to take the country 
securely and safely to the elections because in the elections uh, it is the bridge that uh, they will decide libyans uh, will decide but uh, you know the coup, coup mentalities they want to uh, either prevent the elections or delay the elections or somehow sabotage or rig the elections turkey will be against that and turkey uh, promised you know security and other deals with turkey and uh, you know training programs etc turkey will remain and uh, in in libya until the other i mean other foreign illegitimate presence uh, is out and there are the, there is debate now to to take the uh, foreign forces but there are foreign forces who are not authorized and who are killing and genociding libyan people i mean they are not uh, put into a trial and they uh, turkey will will be supporting libyan people and their ambitions for democracy and stability and development yes uh, and the policies will remain but will be cautious about possible uh, coup attempts or kind of any attempts that may misguide or deviate from the initial project so we will be on alert for, for Libya. So, Anas, how will the new Biden administration, now we have this new administration and the U.S. is returning to the global arena, how do you think the U.S.'s return to the region would influence uh, foreign players in Libya or, let's say, Turkey and Russia's interests and influence in the region? I think the, the Biden administration, having moved from the periphery under Trump, has a major, major challenge under its hand. I think it's gone through several strategies. I mean, the AFRICOM, Africa Command Center in Stuttgart, the military really nerve center that is following Libya, has had a strategy for years that needs to overhaul, which was to contain the instability in Libya. That was its, its words, not mine. I think it's going to have to change that because we look at Russia's position in Libya, which is now to establish a military base in, in central Sirte and Jofra, which is directly challenging NATO's own security at its southern flank. So I think that's going to provoke Russian uh, sorry, that's going to provoke America, uh, America's interest, the Biden administration's interest. But we also have to think of the tools. I don't believe that Biden's administration will necessarily take a very aggressive approach to Libya. There are multiple, multiple arenas where it needs to be involved. And I think Libya is not necessarily its, its clearest priority. But I think if it delegates it to you know, a second tier or a third tier, Libya's strategy or the, the idea that you can contain the instability in Libya is a myth. This is really now a stage where... It's such a difficult geopolitical theater to untangle that doing nothing will be even worse than doing something yes. now, five years' time. So I think the, the sense of urgency will emerge. And I imagine that over the next five years, the Biden administration will have to play its cards. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk.